Uh, yeah, so I, I've been thinking about what to sketch, and here is like a personal sketchbook. You should always carry some sketchbooks with you. And this is, I think, A5 a size. Anyway, so I, I've been thinking what to do, and these are some of the sketches I've done on the plane on my day here. So, as you can see, these sketches are messy and they don't have to look good. Only you're gonna see those, and it's just thinking on the paper. So, I've been thinking about something like this. So, I'll try to briefly sketch this to you just to make sure. So, so what I have in mind is I'm thinking of something like. I'm going to sketch this properly, this is just to show you. Uh, I want to have one unit like this. So one thing I noticed in Pittsburgh is that um, the street, I mean, sidewalks on the street are not always equal or they're not consistent in terms of their sizes. So I thought we could have like one unit like this and there could be the seating part and let's say this is the road because you, you might need to think about the orientation of the thing in the street. So if we, we can use it as like a single unit or we can have like multiple units depending on the space we have. So this could go like this and yeah, that's, that's the thing I'd like to do. So I was thinking about the details. I think I want to have like a metal piece here on both sides, here and here. So on, on top of these, I want to have like a glass surface and here it's gonna be a seating element like this and maybe between those we can have something to put put like posters or whatever so that's that's the thing i have in mind but before we start i want to walk you through some of the things i usually think about before starting a drawing so one thing you should be aware of is this box i just drew and and also the vanishing points so this is not something I would usually do in sketching products. As you see, like my, um, my horizon line is something around here, which is kind of weird because usually what I would do is I would draw the product like this or the cube. I usually start with something rectilinear and then, yeah. This means I'm on top of the object. My horizon line is here. Let's say this is on the table. This would be something this size. But if I'm looking at something on the street size, which is like larger than me, this would be the perspective construction I would build. So basically, you already know this, but this is our horizon line, which means our eye level. So if I'm a person standing, this would be my horizon line. And if I'm looking at something at, at the large level, I'm gonna see it like this. My vanishing points are gonna vanish towards these. If that is too large, like larger than this, it's going to be, it can be about the ground line. So this is like something, a building size maybe, and you can put like a small person and then like this is huge. But if you put something like this, then it is something on the ground and maybe we can see the top, top of the object. Here, I'm gonna use something like this. So 
if you are doing something for street, it's always good to use a person's normal um, eye level view. Otherwise, I mean, I can do something like this, but then the bus stop's gonna look very like monumental, which we don't want that. Uh, we can look from the top of it. I think I have something like this here. So I'm kind of looking at from the top, but this is just to, I think, show some details. So I can do something like this for the bus stop to say, hey, this is like the back side of it. And like I have such and such details around the top part. This could be done as well, but I would use this only to show some details on the back part because normally we, would, we, we are not going to see anything on the street from that level. You can only see that from if you're looking from a building or something. So always try to use the familiar viewpoints and angles so that people can relate to what you're designing or what you're doing. Um, any questions so far on, on these uh, horizon line and vanishing points and that kind of stuff? No? Mm -hmm. Okay, then I want to talk a bit about composition as well. So I'm gonna use this, this paper, which is marker paper, but not great. Uh, I've used better marker papers. Anyway, uh, that's not the point. I wanna say, <clears throat> if you're using, if, you're, if you know what paper you're gonna use, you can just plan, okay, there's gonna be my main view, and maybe I want something like a side view here, because side views are really informative. I think I would put something like this, to say, okay, that's my, uh, let's say it's gonna be like this and this, so here we're gonna have some seating, and let's say that's, that's the human height I will have. So probably I would put something like this on the same page to have, okay, this is my main view, and there's gonna be the like supporting secondary view. Uh, and other than those, I think I could put some details like uh, how these pieces combine, like construction details if you have, or like if you're doing something for the street, the, the part that it meets the street is uh, very important because that's not gonna just come in and stick onto the ground. You're probably gonna have something that's coming up from the ground like this and here maybe that's gonna, I don't know, turn like this and so if you put it like this, you're probably gonna have a detail like this. You can check these details, search on internet, but so it's gonna be a bit more elevated because ground is not even and it's not flat. So you can like support your composition with these types of details because it's a bit difficult to show them in perspective, but you can always show them in side view as like section views maybe. Yeah, so always think about what you want to show and plan it before you dive into your composition. But this is for presentation drawings. If you are just trying to show your ideas like ideation this is not i mean composition is not very important for ideation you can put even post-its and like arrange them or yeah uh so let's go um for this one i actually want to use a mechanical pencil because so that i don't have to sharpen it and i just want to use a ruler so that it's kind of faster. Okay, so as I said, I want my main thing to be around here because if I put this right in the middle of the paper, it's gonna be boring and very static. So I'm thinking of like the golden uh, points. If you divide it, uh, three by three, you probably know this from 
your cones. So this is our page and if you divide it to thirds, those points are going to be the interesting points. So I want my main thing to be around here and maybe the secondary thing to be around here. And I don't want to put them on, on the same level side by side. I want one to be like higher, one to be a bit lower. So that you want to think about how, like where the person looks at first and then what kind of uh, road the eye follows. Maybe that, that person is gonna look at first here and then here and then the smaller details around the lower part. So yeah, let's, let's start. So for this one, I want to have a uh, horizon line first. And my ruler is, is a bit short for this, but that should be fine. So let's just draw And let's draw a vertical one. Yeah. So now I need to think about the height of my thing. So since this is going to be the eye level, I know that a person's eye level is like 175 meters, which you won't understand, <laughs> I think. So what's the, what's, the, what's the person's height in inches? Is it six feet tall normally? A normal average person. Six. Okay. So. Okay, you sh you guys should know this. <laughs> it's there's going to be a convention about this. For okay, for you can convert this for for um, centimeters. It's around one seventy five meters, or you can say one eighty for Americans because you guys are tall. So. I know that this is the person's, a normal person's height. Uh, I say my thing is going to be around 280 or 3, so that, again, where this um, side view comes handy because I know the height of the person and I know how it's proportional to the height of my so design. Well, sorry, oh, thank you. And some other. Okay, <laughs> what are those? <laughs> is that a marker? Yes, these are my old markers. No way. I've never seen those before. Those are Japanese. <coughs> Still good. working? You Are Some. you refilling them? No, I don't refill them. They just work for more than 10 years. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. They are Japanese. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So, uh, okay, let's let's just go and say that's gonna be my height of this thing. So here the angle you adjust is very important. I can do this like this, which says my vanishing point is gonna be very far away, which is not good. And I can do it like this which means also my vanishing point is going to be on the page, which is also not good because it's going to be very, like, mm, distorted. So I want to do something like this, which should look normal. So my vanishing point is out of the page here. So for, for the top part, it's going to be the same thing. So let's say... Okay, this is not going to be eye height. I think. Yeah, I think I want to make it a bit like larger so that I have almost equal. Yeah, I want I want the horizon line to divide this <coughs> almost equally. Yeah, something like this. Now I need to think about the um, depth of of the thing. So I think. This could be fine, let's say like this. So this this is the side of my thing. And 
now we need to find the second uh, vanishing point which is gonna be like farther away and we don't need to draw everything I'm just gonna imagine that it goes somewhere around here like this and let's do the same thing for this one this is gonna come naturally after you do a lot of lots of these so now I need to decide on the um, <coughs> like uh, how wide is one of my units like these so this is just um, guessing or like estimating I'm gonna say it's around somewhere like this so I'm using two-point perspective so my lines my vertical lines are parallel like this Mm, and now I think my like um, depth is a bit too much. I'm gonna shorten it a bit, and I'm not gonna erase my lines. They are it's perfectly okay to to have extra lines. So now I have my first unit as a rectangle. So it's very important to draw the back sides of these. So I'm just gonna carry my lines towards the vanishing point like these and also these these two lines to the vanishing point so that I find the back side so I know that this goes like this I'm just using it a bit like changing the angle a bit so it, that they kind of converge to the same point, but I'm not <coughs> measuring the point. You can do it, but I don't think it's very much necessary. So there goes the backside of my bus stop. So any questions so far? Because that's the most, most important step you would need, like constructing the cube or the rectangle, whatever, properly. So now that I have this, I'm just gonna multiply this. Uh, I'm gonna say let's let's make it three units wide. So now that I know the how like the width of this, I can just cross a line from from the middle point of this. So that's gonna say okay, this and this is gonna be equal. And that's how you find like if you have a rectangle. Just to just as a refresher, so if you have a rectangle in perspective, uh, you just need to draw the diagonals and carry it towards the perspective. And now you know that middle point, you just draw a line across, and then you found the other, like this and this are equal. And you can do it as many times as you want. These goes again to the perspective, just draw a new line. Now that's the same. Now we have three units of the same unit. <coughs> so now that I have this, let's draw it. And I need to do this one more to make it three. As you see, they they grow like they become smaller as they go farther away from us, and that's the convergence. So I'm gonna pull those lines towards vanishing points. So we have our three units equally drawn out. So um, one thing I need to do, I need to draw this, this line as well to the vanishing point and also this line. Okay. 
now I need to give shape to my thing. I'm just going to use this as a construction box and um, do the curly thing that we said we would do. Okay, any questions so far? No? Good? <laughs> you guys think you could do this? Uh, Want to try? No. <laughs> <laughs> It is fun. Don't don't be scared of perspective. Once you get the hang of it, it's it's very much fun. It's like a puzzle. When you're doing like, I know Hassan is gonna tell us like your hands will stop, but do you do like the same type of like perspective lines and stuff? Because I know like I don't know like furniture type stuff. I feel like it's sometimes easier because it's more like geometric. But I know that I'm like really struggling with how to do perspective with the more like organic shapes and stuff like that. Yeah, so these vanishing point type of thing, I only do because <coughs> it's uh, it's on a larger scale. I usually just go with a cube like this. So here, this was kind of organic as well. So I just constructed this beard rectangle and that, that was it, that's how it went. I didn't like think about vanishing points as much because if you know how to draw a cube or a like cubular rectilinear form, you can always use that and like build your stuff within that thing. But here it's more about vanishing points because you are working on a different scale. This is harder for us to do uh, because we are very much used to working on such a scale. So, but it's very helpful if you go out of your comfort zone. So I would just suggest trying this. So yeah, let's go back to our thing. So I know that my thing is, it comes around like this. So I'm just gonna find these points and put this curve around here. So the part that it hits the ground is gonna be there. And the curve, let's say, is going to come around here. And, it's and after that, okay, this is a bit distorted. Here, like this. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So it comes like this. And goes like that, and after that, they just I, I'm just gonna put a pivot around it. So that's the main thing that I have. Okay, so let's just draw those construction units or the metal parts, let's say. So I want these parts to be metal. They could be wood as well, but just to, just for the sake of having different materials, let's say these are going to be metal, this top part is going to be glass, and we can have this as wood for, for the seating parts. Mm -hmm. You can do these by hand as well, but I just want to be a bit more precise. I'm just going to first draw one line for each of these units and then I'm going to give them thickness like width and depth for each of them. It's a bit difficult to read as you put more and more lines, but let's just try to go with it. Yeah. Okay, so far so good. So now I'm just going to offset those lines to give some thickness to those, which is, which would be easier. So how 
thick I want these to be. Not too much, so let's just put these like this. And towards the sides, these should be enough. Yeah, this is using rulers is makes it faster if if your form is not very organic or something, which in this case it makes sense a lot. So I just gave some thickness, which like once you construct this, it's very easy to go on to details because you know where things are. You're just connecting points in in three D. So that shouldn't be so difficult. As I said, like constructing the perspective part is, I would say, 50% of the job. And to be able to fluent in that, you can just look at other, like you can look at photos, you can analyze uh, the lines and where does the vanishing points go and stuff. And you can always use use their vanishing points as a guide, like as a template for your own design as well. But yeah, in our case, I just want to do, do something new, which is not very creative or original, but just to show you guys how how I would go about doing like. Uh, sketching something I have in mind. Okay. After this, I have one more. The closer ones are more important to get it right. But again, check your perspective so nothing looks weird. This is how it looks so far. I think that's about it. So now I just want to add the uh, glass parts on top and then add the um, seating parts. Yeah. Okay, doesn't look so bad. So for, for the glass parts, mm -hmm. So here, where you need to think about details of it, for if you are doing something, as I said, nothing kind of comes and sticks to each other. So for the glass part, I think I have, so this is the metal part. Glass is gonna be a bit like higher and separated. And here maybe we have some construction elements between so that it just, it's important to think about how two different materials come together. So, and this is gonna look way better instead of having something like just stuck on top of something or maybe going inside of it. It could go inside of it, like it could slide. If we had some profile like this as a metal, 
and maybe if we had like a rubber uh, seal we could have something uh, in between as a, like a metal profile but I think this would look cooler because yeah I'm not sure about that <coughs> so let's just put some rectangles on top of this one thing you also want to think about is that this metal part ends here so aligning things in the real world is very difficult so you want to make it either longer or shorter because otherwise people are going to have difficulty <coughs> while they are assembling your design so like in real world it's very difficult to make things like this so you would either go like this or this so maybe this is a bit far away but it's always nice to think about those details so i'm gonna make it a bit on the back side and yeah a bit higher especially than for the larger items uh, like yeah. building or airplane equipment because i does usually they are not built by similar mold. People cut it and there is tolerances that you need to consider. So we have different strategy to hide imperfections of making things. So they may look better if you use a different alignment <coughs> rather than putting them right to the start. <coughs> and you can see the same strategy for cheaper product if you compare your Apple uh, computer with another cheaper laptop then you can see they have different strategies or maybe not there is larger gap between the lines because they are built by indoor technology so there, are <coughs> there is imperfection so they need to somehow reduce uh, or reduce the bad impacts of those imperfections. Yeah, the, the tolerances are always a problem. But if you are working on the product scale, it's tolerances are around like millimeters or microns, which I don't know if, if it means anything to you. But it's like very, very small tolerances. But if you are working on large scale items, it's in like one inch, maybe two inch. So yeah, let's put this. <coughs> Something like this for, for the moment. We can think about the connection details later. Like we can put those later in. Oh, I'm missing some lines here. Mm -hmm. okay. Now let's go back to the seating part. Now, an important thing to think about is uh, again, if we go back to this so wh what's the typical height for a for a chair eight inches, eight inches. Eight inches. Oh, 18 18 9 45 centimeters oh, okay US chairs <laughs> yeah that that's the that's the US height I think for, for from your foot to your knee height yeah so I need to know how, how high my thing is. So I said, this is gonna be like 2.8 meters. So I suspect it's gonna be like one third or one fourth from the ground. So one thing you want to think about is, let's say 
you have this cubular perspective. You always want to measure from this, this line that is closer to you, because if you try to measure from the lines that are on the back, they, they are converging. We don't know how, we don't know the measure, measurements in perspective. But here, uh, I can say, okay, this is gonna be, I don't know, three meters in height. So I can just try to divide these into like four equal parts because this is like parallel. This is not in perspective. So I can say, okay, if this is like three meters, this is gonna be like whatever. So you can scale your stuff and measure your stuff from the front. And you can say, okay, this is the person's height, so the person's gonna be here. Like, always use the front side if you are like comparing your stuff. So I'm gonna use this side to decide on the height of my stuff. And for this one, I'm just gonna do it, like eyeball this one and say, okay, this, this is gonna be the height of my seating area and if that looks like weird you immediately understand and anybody also could always tell that something's going on even if they're not good sketchers or anything because we are good at understanding things in 3D. So let's say yeah, that should do okay. So I just put a plane in perspective just to say okay, that's going to be the seating area. And uh, you can, there are some like wrong lines, but we're, we, we are going to clean them up later. So let's just put something <coughs> like here. And they won't be one piece, so I, I want to break them up where these poles are. Best metal shelf I now know. <laughs> okay, something like this, which should be enough just to suggest that we're gonna have a seating unit over there. And maybe we could put some, some stuff over here so that, say there's gonna be a, maybe poster area or we can put the map of the um, bus, bus stops or whatever. If you're doing something like technological, you can also put like screens, I don't know, or phone chargers. always checking the perspective and like thinking about how do they how my lines okay there there's this mistake yeah i can use it's just a bit off but yeah it's correct it yeah it goes something like this maybe we can put one more on this side Now let's
let's draw the side view for this. Uh, I think I, I want to put it a bit higher than this one. So I'm just going to put a rectangle in the proportions I have. I think it should be around something like this. If not, I can always change it. Let's find the middle point. You should always do side view analysis of your proportions and you should kind of justify why your proportions are like that. Okay. <coughs> it's almost like two squares. Yeah, I think it could be two squares. I make it a bit shorter. Yeah, that should look better. Two squares is usually a good, um, like, golden ratio. Mm -hmm. And also, don't forget to have some slope on your stuff because there's always rain, snow, so don't make it flat. Always think about the outdoor conditions while you're designing for outdoors. Something like this, and we can say there's going to be some detail here, and let's say here is our And where should my human be? I think we can say around here. So I'm just going to suggest maybe something like star person. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. So maybe something like this. And we can put some details around if we, if we want to. So yeah, any questions so far? <coughs> Otherwise, we can go on to some more detailing and maybe some markering. Good? OK. Mm. I think I'm going to draw some details first. or. Uh, what are you most interested in? Markering or? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then. Can um, I s uh, say something here? For sure. Uh, you were started to explain all the details. Probably this is not a process for them to bring their own stuff for ideation, but that is for purpose of uh, teaching or instruction. So probably that's why she's very careful about the details or explaining all of the setup to you, which uh, probably that takes longer than usual for probably her to express this idea. Yeah. So you can probably, when you get uh, up to speed with sketching, then you probably can skip, skip some of the steps and do it faster. Exactly. This could take, I don't know, 20 minutes maybe? But at first, it would used to take me one hour to do something like this. But as, as you go with, it, with time, like the time decreases because you get more comfortable with sketching. So now I would say it would take around maybe 20 minutes. Yeah. OK, so let's go into markering then a bit. So I want to give a general sense of on using markers before I go directly onto marking drawing we have. So how many of you used markers before? Okay. Well I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, I know markers are very like cool and stuff, so you always see those shiny marker renderings on Instagram or over other platforms. Uh, I would say, so, oh, 
my stuff is, I think, around the back, but so yeah, there's another example here. So these kind of marker rendering, you probably wouldn't need this in real life or when you're working for a company or yeah. So this is more like for style, for exploration, for having fun. So don't spend too much time on marking your work. You just need to explain some of your material, some of the like volume and stuff. But this is good to learn how light and like shadow works. So I would say practice with markers, but don't take it too, too seriously. Like I can say like you can be a designer without using markers. So yeah, I think there are some more drawings over here. Yeah, I, I usually like pencil rendering with pencils because a uh, pencil is very versatile. You can just draw with it, shade with it, do anything. So if you have like one thing that can do everything, <coughs> this is more like Apple's pencils to me. So usually I don't use markers for ideation or like for communicating my ideas to other people. So like don't you, you don't need to obsess over it, but they are fun to use, so if you want to learn it, of course, it's it looks nice. So, um, a suggestion to get good at marker rendering. I would suggest you to get a gray set. It doesn't have to be Copics, but just get at least true, uh, three, I would say three different grays. This is, I would say get three, five, and seven maybe, so that you can blend them and like understand how blending and layering works with markers. And with colors, you don't have, so with, with grays, you have like 10%, 20%, that kind of very like equally divided color palette. But with colors, you don't have that. Uh, color system works very differently for every marker brand. So you, you would need to like try and mix and match colors to see how, that, how they kind of blend. So for, for grays, it's pretty kind of straightforward. Um, you can think of them as layers in Photoshop. So let's say we would um, put some gray on a layer and then increase the opacity to let's say 10%. That's how would like a 10% gray works. So one thing you need to try, or I would try, is to check what's what's the uh, tonal range one marker is giving to you. So this is uh, C1, and I just put one layer just to try. And then I'm going to use, like, this is two layers on top. And for this, I'm going to use three layers or more so that you see that it goes darker as I put more layers on top of it. So this is to give you a range of tones so that you can blend it with other, uh, other colors. Sorry, other tones. So let's do this for the whole range of grays and before you put the second layer, you just need to wait a bit so that the marker dries. Basically, there are two actions you can do. One is layering and the other one is blending. For layering, you need to wait because the, the first layer needs to dry before you put the second layer. But for blending, you need to be quick so that you can blend before it dries. So those are the two main actions you can just do with markers. That's essentially it. So I'm just doing some layering on top of them using same marker for every every like row. So what I've done is this is C1, C3, C5, C7, and C9. And this is like one, two, and this is three plus. 
And so one thing you'll notice is that <coughs> if I put some layers, like up to three more layers of one marker, I'm gonna get the other markers. So it's like you are, once you layer one marker, it's like C1 becomes C2 and you are blending one and three together in a way. So I'm kind of layering this one to blend it with the next, next degree, next tone. So if, you, if I just would put it into practice, let's say we have a surface here. I start with one, and then I'm gonna go up to a tree. And normally they are separate. I need to blend in between. So I'm just gonna go with one again and fill it in a bit. So that it kind of makes the blending possible. If you have middle tones, like one, two, three, all of the tones, this becomes easier. But I think it's too much to have, like 10 markers and you need to figure out which one is which. So like doing this, you just get a tonal range so that you can work with markering. And this paper is bleeding, like you see, and normally it's supposed to not do that. But so this is like a test sheet I, I usually do when I get a new uh, paper. So that's, that's the tonal range you can get from like light gray to dark gray. So that's a good practice to try to blend um, markers. And with, with color, it's more difficult. Like you see here, it's not always even. Uh, so I would say first go with grays. And then if you have like a gray blending, you can apply color on top of it. Like say here, I have let's say gray colors, and I want this to be a specific color. If I have one marker from any color I have, I can say, I'm gonna make this red. So you don't have to have three different red values if you have grays. That's kind of the point of having a good range of grays. So, this is perfectly fine to do with markers. I mean, mixing grays and colors, but it's usually not appreciated in other type of media, like, I don't know, oil painting, acrylics, or watercolor, but it's perfectly fine to do with markers. So I would suggest get a gray set <coughs> and then get some colors as you need them and one thing you need to think is that, let's say, this is kind of like a light red. Let's see. So let's test our red here to see how, how many like tonal range I can get from it. And this is more like a saturated kind of red. a bit so th the thing is if you have like a light one you can go for the fir first layer and then you can wait and then you can get the second layer so that it kind of blends but with saturated colors like this it's it's kind of difficult to get a range like here when you have like this is the c9 it's very difficult to get uh, three different range if you have like really saturated markers or colors but if you have light ones you can always apply more and more and you can just 
uh, also with using the grays, you can make it darker. But if it's already dark, you can't go from dark to light, but you can always go from light to dark. So what you want to do is you don't want to buy sets while you are buying markers. Just go and uh, <coughs> try and let's say this green, this is very good because it's kind of light. Is it? Is it this one? No, it's not this one. I think this one. Yeah, so this one is light, so you can wait a bit and now you have light gray and dark like middle gray. You have actually two gray uh, greens. So yeah, go for the light, at least like mid-range light uh, colors. But yeah, as long as you have grays like these, if I want to make it this darker, I can always apply some grays on top of it. Yeah. So that's that's the general <coughs> project behind having grays and uh yeah, I think I already showed you how to do color on top of um like if you want to check out these and close up. I can have it here. <coughs> yeah, that's that's how you would go about it. Another thing you want to do is let's say okay. it's easy to do if you are doing it on like a 2D surface like this, because then you just need to draw straight lines like, like this. So <coughs> once you learn to do this properly, it's not gonna look like different lines, but it's gonna look like one like complete fill from, from a distance. And that's what you kind of want. You don't want to see the different uh, like strokes but this is kind of difficult to do when you are doing something like a real thing because the thing you are doing is in perspective so two things you want to check is one the shape of the surface or like the form so if I'm doing this surface, I want to do it like this because the surface is flat and it's in perspective converging towards this side. I, I want my strokes to be on this direction. If I'm doing this direction, I want to do it like this. So that's one thing you want to check. So if you are doing, let's say, a cylinder, you would want to have these to go like this instead of doing these. So yeah, uh, anything else? Uh, you want to be a bit quick because let's say this is usually how I would do, but if you're going very slow, I'm kind of you know, afraid, like going slow, fast, slow, fast. So marker is gonna kind of bleed and it's gonna look darker and it's gonna like suck out your ink from your marker. So just be try to be smooth and think of it as if you are drawing straight lines. So this is kind of a good practice. Try to fill it fill like 2D uh, blocks. And you, you would usually do this for your backgrounds. <coughs> yeah. Uh, any questions about these? Good? Okay. Um, let's try to do this, but, well, I think this is going to be very quick because we don't have large surfaces over this. So what I would do for this 
Mm, one thing you need to be careful is the kind of order of things. Now, I, I know that this metal thing is in front of my glass surface. So I would first peel, I think, the glass part and then <coughs> peel the metal part. Or at least I would be careful to not to make glass part a bit more like um, I would avoid uh, like putting some gray on the on the glass part. Yeah. So uh, one thing you want to think about is the direction of light. So um, here, uh, I think I would have some like some of the attention here, and I would have some contrast over <coughs> here, and then towards towards the side, it would kind of fade. So I will have some grays on these metal part, and try to have some wood material on the on this side, and maybe some blues over here. And if you have some wood, yeah, that that's very helpful because I don't have wood colors at all. Okay, so starting with light, I just got the C3 gray. I'm just gonna fill fill in the metal part, and I'm not worried about um, my pencil lines because they're gonna kind of um, go towards the back as I fill these in. So one thing I want to have is, now I haven't done it yet, but as you'll see it looks very flat, but I want to differentiate between the side that is like facing towards this side and facing towards us, so that it's kind of apparent that they are two different faces. So I want to have, I think I want to have this, this inner face a bit darker because light is coming from this side, this, this uh, thinner face is gonna be, it's, it's gonna look lighter. So I've done three, I, I wanna go back with um, five to make it look darker. And if you, like sometimes marker bleeds and I kind of go out of the lines from place to place, but that's fine because after we finish markering, I'm gonna go back with the pencil and clean up uh, my surrounding lines. And you can always go with this thinner side if you're, if you're kind of afraid of messing up. So. And the other thing you want to be careful is that marker first looks very dark and juicy, but after you wait a bit, it kind of dries and it becomes lighter. So now at least I can tell that they are different sides, but it looks a bit messy and I'm gonna clean this up. So one thing about this it looks is it looks very dull because everything has the same value, like this is, Three, this is five and it's like you selected an area in Photoshop and you just filled it with color but in real life we don't have these like flat looking uh, colors so what I want to do is I know that this part is like curving like this so it's not gonna get too much light so this part is gonna be darker because it's in the shadow kind of so I'm gonna go back with either five again to make it darker, or I can even go up to seven to get a gradient like over there. You always want to have some gradient because otherwise it doesn't look very interesting. Now let's punch this a bit and you'll see how it gets kind of more interesting. Just slide a bit more five. And I want to make it even more, even darker. So I'll just go with seven. 
Now you want to be a bit more quick because this is now very dark and before it dries I want to blend it with my five. Yeah, this should be fine. And back from here like this. Now you see that when you look at it, your eye goes directly to here because there's contrast. That's what you want to do. You want to you want your viewer to look at where you want them to look at without telling them to say like, hey, please look at here. No, you are doing this without saying anything. So I want to do these for each of these poles. And, but again, I don't want each pole to have this, this type of contrast because then you don't know which one to look at. I want the closer one to have more contrast so that uh, it's more apparent. And one thing at the back is I have the seating element, which is kind of casting shadow on this part. So it's going to have some, um, it's going to be a bit dar darker. So these kind of details make you make your drawing a bit more realistic. And yeah, and if I don't, I haven't thought about this um, details of this um, like surface uh, for posters yet, but I'm assuming this is on top of our like metal pole. So this also might cast some shadow on, on this part. So let's try to say, um, I can actually use a um, ruler here. So let's say I'm gonna have something like this. Now you see it's in front of that pole, literally because it's casting some shadow. And also it casts some shadow on the bottom. So these type of details add kind of <coughs> realism to your thing, but it depends on how much time you have. And yeah, you don't always need realism in, in your work. So yeah, let's go, go on to the others. So, um, how far is about the rule of perspective when you use the color, the saturated, more saturated color, yeah. come closer, a bit closer, and uh, lighter, less saturated colors go further. So, this is another thing that uh, may help your design or presentation. Exactly. So one thing I'm doing is that when I'm using this side, okay. I don't always do this, but sometimes I do this so that I don't have to switch back and forth with this side, which is like this is even thinner. But sometimes if I'm filling thin areas, I just go with this or you can even do other stuff with this. Yeah. Just try to exploit the kind of affordances your tool is giving. Um, one thing to think about is if you're working on white paper, you want to think about the white areas before you fill them in. So right now I'm trying, I'm kind of filling everything in because I know that it's going to look like dark because metal is kind of dark. But if you want to leave some highlights beforehand, you can do that. And if you don't, that's fine because that's why we have uh, white ones so that I can just go back and like correct those, which is I usually go like that, but if you look at the cubes around there, 
I left some white space on the top part so that I don't have to go back and try to put some white and I'm also saving some marker ink because that's how you usually use markers it's kind of less is more type of thing yeah so let's go back with in addition if you use the warmer color in a closer <coughs> parts of the paradise they do closer to us and you can use the warmer color closer and cooler color further it is another perspective to you can have the further parts of the product more undone without touching or without doing too much marker and ink and you can focus more on the closer parts to do it faster and So I kind of let this part fade away towards the top part because towards like the top part it's getting more light because the angle is like this but the part where it's kind of curved is it's, it gets darker around that curve. So you also see that this is much darker than this one because I want the attention here. I'm going to do the, do the same thing to the others. and try to, like I'm doing this type of action, just holding my hand before I go, instead of every time doing this, I can do this. I'm kind of tapering my marker lines. Uh, what is the time? Okay, so, I'll try to finish this in half an hour if you guys would be interested in trying some perspective sketching so that I can give some feedback. How do you, how do you feel about that? Or Sounds good to me. Cool? Yeah. Okay then. Let's get this done. <coughs> Because, yeah, once you understand one part, it's more or less the same for the other parts. So I'm going to come back to the other parts, but first, one thing I usually do while I'm mar marking is that I don't work on one part and try to finish it at once. I try to go onto different parts, so while I'm working on here, this dries, and then I, I can see the real value of the ink. So I'll, for, for now, I'll let this like this, and I'm gonna go on, tea, um, on the glass part so that, yeah, later on I can come back and continue. For the glass, I have two um, blues with me. The one is the light blue, which is like better because I can get at least two values with this, which I think that's, I'm going to use only this one. I don't think I'm gonna need, I'll need this one, which is slightly darker. But you see that they are in the same family. And with colors, it's very difficult to match them. So let me show. Let me see if you have some blues. There are the colors are very different. There's like cobalt blue. There is Mediterranean blue. There are all types of blues. So if you if you try to match this, let's say, with this one, that's not possible. You won't be able to do it because that's a whole another different blue. So that's why colors are a bit more difficult, and that's why it's nice to start with grays. So let's see this one. This is very light. And so you, you see this one is more like purplish. So labels are very kind of confusing. It's not always the same color as you see on the label, always. 
try them on before buying them. And if you have like some colors, you know, that work well, uh, try to go with them instead of, yeah, like for these, I know they're supposed to work together. This is uh, chrome orange and what is this? This is cadmium orange, but yeah, even then, it's not it's not always easy to blend them. Yeah, and it's not your fault. It's just the way they are. Yeah. So um, the glass part. So for the glass, it's even more. The less is more thing. So let me just try to illustrate this it here. So let's say I have this plane, which is glass. You always want to think about the thickness of the glass because it's visible. So here I'm going to see this thickness here, which is going to be lighter, but I'm going to see it anyway. So it's not paper, it has some thickness. So usually you're not going to approach it as if, as if you would uh, to a matte surface. Let's say if this was a, like a normal surface, I would go simply, I would fill it in like this, right? But this doesn't really look like glass because glass is usually very reflective. Yeah, this is how I would do a normal, I don't know, plastic or whatever. But for glass, you want to be kind of expressive so if you look at any glass piece, you'll see that uh, the sides of it are very usually dark because that's where you get refraction. Uh, light is kind of trapped and then you get this dark light. And around the here, you have like weird kind of reflections depending on your like environment and surroundings. So, if I want to do glass, I would do just something like this. And it kind of depends on your uh, composition and other stuff as well. So let's try to do this on here. First, I want to go with the sides. Yeah, it's hard to resist markering, like doing marker rendering in a full, full way, but you just need to stop and suggest that, okay, that's glass. And later we will come back and add some other stuff to make it look, look more contrasting. But for now, that should be enough. And one thing to, for glass, it's always nice if you are working on colored paper, like we did yesterday. Because you can add um, some white as reflection on it. But, I mean, you don't have to. For now, I'll, I'll say this should be enough, and then I'll just go for the other parts. For these surfaces, I don't know if I should put anything, so I'm just going to suggest that there is something like maybe like this. Instead of leaving it empty, I'm just going to put some gray marker 
and say, okay. Maybe something like this, so that we know there is some area that I can put something on. If you're very like curious, you can always print stuff and just make it like a collage. You can put real stuff inside. That's how I would do if I were in Photoshop or or in a digital environment so yeah let's go for this wooden part i was thinking maybe if i could do so if i don't have wood colors i would just go with this orange and try to make it like dark um dark type of wood but since you brought me some markers i think i'm gonna go with some of these. Let's see. No. As you see, they, they don't look. I mean, the names or the labels are kind of weird. This could work, this brownish, yeah. And there are a few over here. Mahogany. Mm, this is about to be over. This is dying. <laughs> Any preferences? This says well no. Hmm, this one also good. Looks good. Mm. I'm not sure. What what do you guys say? Any preference over the color? Mm, this is too light. I would say either this brown or this walnut. Yeah. What did you say? The brown looks better. This? Okay. Let's go for this one. <coughs> so for this, it's going to take just a second because this is such a like small area. Uh, first, I kind of outline and then kind of fill in like this. And since it's, it's wood, you kind of be, you kind of want to be a bit irregular. You can leave white spaces. I'm just going to wait a bit for it to dry to come back. So let me show it in a more in a different area, like how I would do. This is the one. Okay, there's something here. So let's say I'm doing wood on the surface. You would just and try to be like not too straight with your lines you can just try to imitate the wood grain and maybe put some dots so it implies there's something going on and I would just wait a bit and then put maybe some darker lines like this so implying further wood grain. And depending on the level of detail you need to have, it should kind of work. Yeah. And lastly I would just have some pencil line as like to say hey there's this real grain thing going on here like this and you can always also have some white around that grain yeah that's how you would basically go for the wood it's it's good to be imperfect 
and to be weird. But this is very, like, this is so small. We won't have these type of details in this one. But wood is very, like, it's kind of my favorite material to render because you have all those irregularities that kind of makes it unique. So yeah, I'm just going to go add some lines around this. And so, as we had with the metal, now it looks like a one, one piece kind of thing, but I want to differentiate this. There is the side surface, there is this front surface to it. So what I want to do is I'm just going to go with a dark gray to say, okay, here is the front face, which is like facing towards us. So that now at least I see, okay, it has a thickness. And also for the bottom part, it's gonna get uh, some shadows around here. So that's also good to add. And maybe we can add some grays as, as the wood grain towards here. And like I said, we can go back with pencil we can do this later too but I just want to add it for now some parts and one thing I want to be clear is that there is this separation going on it's not one piece so I want to put these lines back to say hey it's like a three piece thing it's not just one piece So yeah, um, what I would do from now on is I would put some shadow on the ground and I would clean up some, some of the edges, I think, and that would be about it. Any questions so far on this one? Okay, then let's go ahead and finish it. So for the shadow, I'm just going to put like a general thing around here as the shadow and once it kind of get close to what I have as the poles it's gonna get darker and now let's go back with pencil to make the lines a bit more darker So using a ruler at this stage is very important, I think, to kind of punch the lines you already have. So here, it, the, the point it meets the ground, they're going to get shadows around here, so the lines are going to be thicker. After this stage, it's going to look kind of neat and also like easier to read. You can already see it's getting a bit better. I can also go darker with this one. So these are, this is very thin and this is Premiere. I like this one, but it kind of breaks a lot because it's very hard. There, it's not waxy. And this is good to use after markering because <coughs> if you, let's say here, this, this is this pen. So don't do this but just to show you, it kind of dissolves your um, pencil. So try to avoid using your markers over pencils because now it's gonna, gonna kind of collect that black and you're gonna write it with some black pencil and then you need to go back and clean. So 
I usually try to use these as, as the last step, but sometimes I really like sketching with these and then sometimes I use markers on top of them, which like I shouldn't do, but it's not like a rule. You can, you can do stuff as you want to, but it's not suggested, so don't do it, I should say, but I do it. After doing this step, we're going to add some whites to um, make the parting lines more deliberate. Uh, I don't want to go over all of the lines I have because otherwise it's going to look very stiff. So one thing I usually do, I think I showed it yesterday here. So while I'm using rulers, let's say I have these two points and what I would normally do, I would just connect these points with a single, like, constant line. But this looks very boring. So what I usually do is I kind of taper my lines like this. And I go back and add some, some more, even more, like, here. So it looks like it has some direction. It's more dynamic. So that's how I would suggest you to do it. Otherwise, it's going to look like a technical drafting type of drawing, which we don't kind of want because um, the sketch is kind of different. So you want some kind of flexibility so that it's kind of open to interpretation. You don't want it to look very finished because you can always go back and change things. And it's also more open to like interpretation and feedback if, if your sketch is kind of still, um, I don't know, in a way kind of unfinished. Yeah, um, I think the glass parts look very kind of messy, so I need to go back make those look a bit more tighter. Yep. So yeah, you, you guys have your designs or like ideas, I guess, from last week or the other week. Mm -hmm. So um, try to think about how you would want to portray them to your audience, what type of perspective you would choose, what type of viewpoint you would go for, like the composition we talked about, and then, yeah, let's try to sketch some stuff. Um, You don't need to marker them, but it's just good to have a line drawing. And what I usually do before going into markering, I kind of copy my um, line drawing. Either I photocopy it or just use an underlay and go like go on on top of it if it's like an easy drawing. But it's good to kind of um, have something as a backup because you might always mess up while we are like markering and then it's very difficult to like go back from start and draw it again so I usually uh, copy those if I'm doing like a very illustrative type of thing yeah so I'm gonna go back to this glass part a bit more I'm going to make the edges a bit darker and I think I can even pull 
I'll do with this. Yeah, now it starts to look more glass-like because there's going to be like refractions around those. Also on the back side. Yeah. Sometimes details kind of make a difference after after a certain point. better mm. you can also use like I think we need to support these lines a bit more because now it's not very readable so can you just hold this for me yeah. that's the type like distance you want to look at your design it's always good to take a step back and yeah I think I might want like a background around these two because now it's kind of thank you it's kind of difficult to tell that these two really connect <coughs> but first let me just go around these lines in a bit and then the background thing do you have something like yeah something like this might work or maybe this um, I think I might go for for this one so let's think about this um, if that's gonna work very well but let's try and experiment it's good to have some background with the glass because the glass is kind of gonna show through and I don't need to fill it like very carefully, I think you just like this can fade away as we go. Here it could be a bit darker because it's like casting a shadow to its background. Maybe something like this. I'm not sure if it's better, but I think it's good to connect those up two elements. Yeah, it's kind of collecting the pencil thing. Okay. What else? Um, white ones. Okay, so let me see if I have a cube over there. Can I get that, please? Thanks. Yeah. For this cube, let's say, I think I have some on this one already, but yeah. If you go back and add some 
like whites around the edges it's gonna kind of pop so it's always good to come back and let's say if I have a parting line on this surface let's try to do it those let's say this cube is comprised of two two parts I need another like white in front of that black because that part's gonna take some now it looks much real what happens is that let's take this one okay can you guys see I, i'm not sure if you can okay this is so what happens is I have the surface, something comes in and I have another part, it comes in and comes like this. So if you zoom in to like two materials coming together, you're going to see like two little fillets around there. So let's say light is coming from that part. This is the light direction, light direction, light direction. So here on this fillet, it's going to cast a shadow because uh, it's like tangent to that surface. So here I'm going to have like a black line. And here it's like coming on 90 degree on that fillet. So I'm going to have like a white line here. So this is going to be white <coughs> and this is going to be black. So if you have two different materials <coughs> coming together or, or let's say on this um, wood, wood thing, you have, let's say, a crack. So I would just put like a dark line and then a white line depending on the um, light direction. So now I see that there's like a hole or a crack or something going on over there. So it's always nice to zoom in while if you have some like difficulty imagining what's going on over there just try to magnify that part and focus on that yeah what i was saying yeah we were doing this key thing yeah so for whites i'm using this uh uni posca thing this is nice because it has some opacity to it so if i just put one line it's gonna be like not very 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 white but if I just put second like more layers on top of it it's gonna have it's gonna be more like wider so that's the thing I was talking about tapering your lines never put like one line and leave it always have some like your lines should have this dynamic thing to it so this is nice to use. Uh, I have also this uh, jelly roll, which is similar but thinner. Sometimes you need very like detailed thin line, and this is good for that. And um, I like it because it lasts long. Because this white ink is kind of very different. Sometimes it it clogs and stuff but this is a good good brand and i also have this uh thick white marker uh it's faber castell which is this thick guy i usually don't use this because it's like i like subtle lines i don't like very like in your face type of thing so I don't know, I don't usually use this, but it's good for, let's say, for, for glass, this type of things are very useful. You, you want to have something like this. If you're like doing a glass uh, cup or something, uh, yeah, these are good to show that there's something going on, like reflected over there. Uh, I had some 
Yeah, like pencils as well. Yeah. Again, I, I got these when I got here. I used to use Faber Castells. Mm -hmm. uh, I think these are very similar, these two. Um, so I'm not looking for new ones. I think I can always order from Amazon or something, but yeah. These are good. This is also very thin. I had a longer one. I don't know where it is. It doesn't matter. So um, we can go back with this. So I told you about this uh, parting line thing, like white next to the black. Now I'm going to use this to say, OK, these are different like seating groups. So I'm just going to put a white line next to black. Now you can tell that it's picking up light, so it must be something like it must be another point. So also here, I'm going to get some light around this, also around here, around these guys. You can always put some, like if you think somewhere is very dark, let's say if I think this this part is very dark, I can always lighten it by adding some light on top of it. And also vice versa. You can go and add some, like, you can add some shadow. I think I forgot to add shadows for these. Uh, let's add them. Um, yeah, it goes around like this. Um, let's use these. It's always around the edges. The light is, the object kind of catches light because there are small fillets like we talked about. Nothing is really um, sharp around the edges. So yeah, it's nice to put some light around the edges always. Um, I can add some light on top of the gray so that it says, hey, I'm catching some light over here. So that it adds more contrast because we have this dark area and now I have white next to it and it says, hey, I'm here. Yeah, um, and also let's put some on the wood surface. So one thing with, with wood, there's our wood, oh, yeah. so here it's not very apparent, but normally what you would do is, so this has to have some thickness around it. If the grain is on this like direction, then it means it's gonna come like this around here. Because that's actually, so wood, wood grain is like this, and you are like kind of cutting this piece out of wood. So in one direction you will have circular grains, and in other directions, let's say this goes like this, you will have um, like straight grains. So think about these as well while you are designing stuff and 
also rendering stuff. This kind of adds like realism to it. I would do that, but here it's not going to be very apparent. But if I were doing something um, on the product scale, that would be really important. So yeah, um, yeah. I think that's more or less about it. I can go for maybe ten more minutes, but it's not gonna make a huge difference. It's just correcting some mistakes, tightening some lines. I think it's kind of already there. I wouldn't spend more time on this one and I would just go to the next um, concept if I were doing this for a presentation. I think, yeah, it's already more than enough. Any questions, any, any part that I miss or haven't covered? You you usually do like callouts in your sketches. Uh, if if this is a concept presentation, yes, you you would. Yeah, I think we talked about detailing, so we can we can do that. Now I made a mistake, by the way. If you have seen it, now I'm kind of correcting it with the white. So that's something we can also do. Uh, let's put some details for this one. Mm. So, as we talked about, I think I have some details around here. Mm. Yeah, kind of the similar thing I talked about. Yeah, so let's say for this one, mm, we can say, you can also give um, dimensions, so you can say, this is like whatever inches, and I'm gonna have like this metric or whatever standard you're using. Uh, screw over there, and that's gonna come and go to whatever thing. So let's go with this. And of course, I wouldn't use markers on these details. It's just to show some part. So if I were, let's say, um, a senior designer, which I was before coming here, I would just hand this. Of course, I wouldn't do this by hand. I, I would probably use a digital tool for, for this. But I, I could hand this to a junior designer to model model it so that would be very legible if I had these details around here and I would say okay this is gonna be this material this thick so there it goes like my detail and then it should be very like legible and you would do these for here for here for here and also for the glass part so let's just make something up <coughs> and say, okay, that's the that's the glass part and that's the metal part. So say something we have <coughs> here. up to you but yeah that's how you would kind of communicate what's going on there and it would be a bit more realistic if we would put something just over there to say okay that's that's kind of connecting to what I have here because we are kind of seeing it from like bottom and we should be able to see some joining details. I would think about that in the kind of early phase and throw those details out, but 
even now, it's kind of looking better. Um, yeah, what else? So <coughs> for this one, hmm, let's say for here, maybe let's say here we have this. I'm going to sketch this in perspective. Here I have this metal profile, and then wood kind of maybe comes inside like this. Yeah. So maybe that's the part. And for that, I can go back and say here, I'm going to see some metal part or something like that. Yeah, and for also the other detailing part, we can say that's going to come like this. And yeah, I'm going to have some connectors here. This again depends on like the stage you are, you are in in the design process. So if you are doing ideation or concept presentation, I wouldn't worry about these because those are the details you can think about later. But if this is your final presentation, then yeah, you might think about those. So maybe that's the type of detail I want here. <coughs> or yeah. You can always write stuff like <coughs> I don't know. You can have your name here if you have a concept name. I would give some dimensions definitely here. So I would say this is 280 and this is 175. And yeah, because that's going to be important for a person to understand the proportions and everything. And this is 140. This line is going to be much darker. Yeah, more or less something like this. It's not perfect, but it kind of works. And 